section forty seven of one thousand things worth knowing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b one thousand things worth knowing by nathaniel c fowler jr star spangled banner the national song of the united states composed by francis scott key on the night of september thirteenth eighteen fourteen the cartel ship minden was anchored in sight of fort mchenry and from her deck key saw during the night of thirteen september eighteen fourteen the bombardment of that fortress it was during the excitement of this attack and while pacing the deck of the minden with intense anxiety between midnight and dawn that key composed the song it was first written on the back of a letter and after his return to baltimore copied out in full harper's book of facts statistics of population united states by states population of continental united states by divisions and states nineteen hundred and nineteen ten and rank in population we have a listing by geographic division and state and then population in nineteen hundred and nineteen ten and then rank in population nineteen hundred and nineteen ten continental united states ninety one million nine hundred seventy two thousand two hundred sixty six seventy five million nine hundred ninety four thousand five hundred seventy five geographic divisions new england six million five hundred fifty two thousand six hundred eighty one five million five hundred ninety two thousand seventeen seventh seventh middle atlantic nineteen million three hundred fifteen thousand eight hundred ninety two fifteen million four hundred fifty four thousand six hundred seventy eight first second east north central eighteen million two hundred fifty thousand six hundred twenty one fifteen million nine hundred eighty five thousand five hundred eighty one second first west north central eleven million six hundred thirty seven thousand nine hundred twenty one ten million three hundred forty seven thousand four hundred twenty three fourth fourth south atlantic twelve million one hundred ninety four thousand eight hundred ninety five ten million four hundred forty three thousand four hundred eighty third third east south central eight million four hundred nine thousand nine hundred one seven million five hundred forty seven thousand seven hundred fifty seven sixth fifth west south central eight million seven hundred eighty four thousand five hundred thirty four six million five hundred thirty two thousand two hundred ninety fifth sixth mountain two million six hundred thirty three thousand five hundred seventeen one million six hundred seventy four thousand six hundred fifty seventh ninth ninth pacific four million one hundred ninety two thousand three hundred four two million four hundred sixteen thousand six hundred ninety two eighth eighth new england maine seven hundred forty two thousand three hundred seventy one six hundred ninety four thousand four hundred sixty six thirty fourth thirty first new hampshire four hundred thirty thousand five hundred seventy two four hundred eleven thousand five hundred eighty eight thirty ninth thirty seventh vermont three hundred fifty five thousand nine hundred fifty six three hundred forty three thousand six hundred forty one forty second thirty ninth massachusetts three million three hundred sixty six thousand four hundred sixteen two million eight hundred five thousand three hundred forty six sixth seventh rhode island five hundred forty two thousand six hundred ten four hundred twenty eight thousand five hundred fifty six thirty eighth thirty fifth connecticut one million one hundred fourteen thousand seven hundred fifty six nine hundred eight thousand four hundred twenty thirty first twenty ninth middle atlantic new york nine million one hundred thirteen thousand six hundred fourteen seven million two hundred sixty eight thousand eight hundred ninety four first first new jersey two million five hundred thirty seven thousand one hundred sixty seven one million eight hundred eighty three thousand six hundred sixty nine eleventh sixteenth 
pennsylvania seven million six hundred sixty five thousand one hundred eleven six million three hundred two thousand one hundred fifteen second second east north central ohio four million seven hundred sixty seven thousand one hundred twenty one four million one hundred fifty seven thousand five hundred forty five fourth fourth indiana two million seven hundred thousand eight hundred seventy six two million five hundred sixteen thousand four hundred sixty two ninth eighth illinois five million six hundred thirty eight thousand five hundred ninety one four million eight hundred twenty one thousand five hundred fifty third third michigan two million eight hundred ten thousand one hundred seventy three two million four hundred twenty thousand nine hundred eighty two eighth ninth wisconsin two million three hundred thirty three thousand eight hundred sixty two million sixty nine thousand forty two thirteenth thirteenth west north central minnesota two million seventy five thousand seven hundred eight one million seven hundred fifty one thousand three hundred ninety four nineteenth nineteenth iowa two million two hundred twenty four thousand seven hundred seventy one two million two hundred thirty one thousand eight hundred fifty three fifteenth tenth missouri three million two hundred ninety three thousand three hundred thirty five three million one hundred six thousand six hundred sixty five seventh fifth north dakota five hundred seventy seven thousand fifty six three hundred nineteen thousand one hundred forty six thirty seventh fortieth south dakota five hundred eighty three thousand eight hundred eighty eight four hundred one thousand five hundred seventy thirty six thirty eighth nebraska one million one hundred ninety two thousand two hundred fourteen one million sixty six thousand three hundred twenty ninth twenty seventh kansas one million six hundred ninety thousand nine hundred forty nine one million four hundred seventy thousand four hundred ninety five twenty second twenty second south atlantic delaware two hundred two thousand three hundred twenty two one hundred eighty four thousand seven hundred thirty five forty seventh forty fifth maryland one million two hundred ninety five thousand three hundred forty six one million one hundred eighty eight thousand forty four twenty seventh twenty sixth district of columbia three hundred thirty one thousand sixty nine two hundred seventy eight thousand seven hundred eighteen forty third forty first virginia two million sixty one thousand six hundred twelve one million eight hundred fifty four thousand one hundred eighty four twentieth seventeenth west virginia one million two hundred twenty one thousand one hundred nineteen nine hundred fifty eight thousand eight hundred twenty eighth twenty eighth north carolina two million two hundred six thousand two hundred eighty seven one million eight hundred ninety three thousand eight hundred ten sixteenth fifteenth south carolina one million five hundred fifteen thousand four hundred one million three hundred forty thousand three hundred sixteen twenty sixth twenty fourth georgia two million six hundred nine thousand one hundred twenty one two million two hundred sixteen thousand three hundred thirty one tenth eleventh florida seven hundred fifty two thousand six hundred nineteen five hundred twenty eight thousand five hundred forty two thirty third thirty third east south central kentucky two million two hundred eighty nine thousand nine hundred five two million one hundred forty seven thousand one hundred seventy four fourteenth twelfth tennessee two million one hundred eighty four thousand seven hundred eighty nine two million twenty thousand six hundred sixteen seventeenth fourteenth alabama two million one hundred thirty eight thousand ninety three one million eight hundred twenty eight thousand six hundred ninety seven eighteenth eighteenth mississippi one million seven hundred ninety seven thousand one hundred fourteen one million five hundred fifty one thousand two hundred seventy twenty first twentieth west south central arkansas one million five hundred seventy four thousand four hundred forty nine one million three hundred eleven thousand five hundred sixty four twenty fifth twenty fifth louisiana one million six hundred fifty six thousand three hundred eighty eight 
one million three hundred eighty one thousand six hundred twenty five twenty fourth twenty third oklahoma one million six hundred fifty seven thousand one hundred fifty five seven hundred ninety thousand three hundred ninety one twenty third thirtieth texas three million eight hundred ninety six thousand five hundred forty two three million forty eight thousand seven hundred ten fifth sixth mountain montana three hundred seventy six thousand fifty three two hundred forty three thousand three hundred twenty nine fortieth forty third idaho three hundred twenty five thousand five hundred ninety four one hundred sixty one thousand seven hundred seventy two forty fifth forty sixth wyoming one hundred forty five thousand nine hundred sixty five ninety two thousand five hundred thirty one forty eighth forty eighth colorado seven hundred ninety nine thousand twenty four five hundred thirty nine thousand seven hundred thirty second thirty second new mexico three hundred twenty seven thousand three hundred one one hundred ninety five thousand three hundred ten forty fourth forty fourth arizona two hundred four thousand three hundred fifty four one hundred twenty two thousand nine hundred thirty one forty sixth forty seventh utah three hundred seventy three thousand three hundred fifty one two hundred seventy six thousand seven hundred forty nine forty first forty second nevada eighty one thousand eight hundred seventy five forty two thousand three hundred thirty five forty ninth forty ninth pacific washington one million one hundred forty one thousand nine hundred ninety five hundred eighteen thousand one hundred three thirtieth thirty fourth oregon six hundred seventy two thousand seven hundred sixty five four hundred thirteen thousand five hundred thirty six thirty fifth thirty sixth california two million three hundred seventy seven thousand five hundred forty nine one million four hundred eighty five thousand fifty three twelfth twenty first end of section forty seven Section 48 of 1,000 Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano 1,000 Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Chapter 48 Stature and Weights There have appeared in public print several tables, which, the compilers claim, are based upon Greek and other measurements. It is probable that few of these tables are authentic, and many of them are undoubtedly incorrect. The following table is compiled by J. W. Seaver, M. D., for twenty years professor at Yale University, and is as nearly correct as possibility would admit. Dr. Seaver, however, does not claim absolute correctness. The second and third tables given are used quite generally in civil service examinations by local, state, and national governments, and apply largely to those seeking positions on the police force or the fire department height and weight males and females height and feet five males weight fat one thirty six normal one twelve females weight fat one twenty two normal one o two height and feet five point one males weight fat one forty one normal one sixteen females weight fat one twenty eight normal one o six height and feet five point two males fat one forty six normal one twenty females weight fat one thirty four normal one o nine height and feet five point three males weight fat one fifty two normal one twenty five 
Females weight. Fat, 140. Normal, 113. Height and feet, 5.4. Males, weight. Fat, 160. Normal, 130. Females, weight. Fat, 145. Normal, 117. Height and feet, 5.5. Males, weight. Fat, 167. Normal, 135. Females, weight. Fat, 151. Normal, 121. Height and feet, 5.6. Males, weight. Fat, 175. Normal, 138. Females, weight. Fat, 154. Normal, 125. Height and feet, 5.7. Males, weight. Fat, 182. Normal, 140. Females, weight. Fat, 157. Normal, 130. Height and feet, 5.8. Males, weight. Fat, 189. Normal, 143. Females, weight. Fat, 160. Normal, 135. Height and feet, 5.9. Males, weight. Fat, 196. Normal, 150. Females, weight. Fat, 169. Normal, 140. Height and feet, 5.10. Males, weight. Fat, 203. Normal, 155. Females, weight. Fat, 173. Normal, 145. Height and feet, 5.11. Males, weight. Fat, 210. Normal, 160. Females, weight. Fat, 179. Normal, 150. Height and feet, 6. Males, weight. Fat, 216. Normal, 165. Females, weight. Fat, 185. Normal, 155. Height and feet, 6.1. Males, weight, fat, 221, normal, 170. Females, weight, fat, 187, normal, 160. Height and feet, 6.2. Males, weight, fat, 226, normal, 175. Females, weight, fat, 196. Normal, 166. Height and feet, 6.3. Males, weight. Fat, 231. Normal, 180. Females, weight. Fat, 205. Normal, 171. End of Table 1. Minimum circumference of the chest. Tolerable in applicants. Height, circumference of chest. Height, feet, five, six inches. Circumference of chest, thirty-two and one-half inches. Height, five feet, seven inches. Circumference of chest, thirty-three inches. Height, five feet, seven and one-half inches. Circumference of chest, thirty-three and one-half inches. Height, five feet, eight inches. Circumference of chest, 34 inches. Height, 5 feet 9 inches. Circumference of chest, 34 and 1 half inches. Height, 5 feet 10 inches. Circumference of chest, 35 inches. Height, 5 feet 11 inches. Circumference of chest, 35 and 1 half inches. Height, 6 feet. Circumference of chest, 36 inches. Height, 6 feet 1 inch. Circumference of chest, 
36 and one half inches height feet six feet two inches circumference of chest thirty seven height six feet three inches circumference of chest thirty seven and one quarter inches height six feet four inches circumference of chest thirty eight inches end of table two the stature shall not be below five feet six inches nor the weight below that marked as its minimum accompaniment in the subjoined table height feet inches minimum pounds average pounds maximum weight pounds height five feet six inches minimum pounds one hundred thirty six average pounds one hundred forty three maximum weight in pounds one hundred and eighty height five feet seven inches minimum pounds one hundred thirty eight average pounds one hundred forty six maximum weight in pounds one hundred eighty seven height five feet eight inches minimum pounds one hundred and forty average pounds one hundred and forty eight maximum weight in pounds one hundred ninety five height five feet nine inches minimum pounds one hundred forty five average pounds one hundred fifty five maximum weight in pounds two hundred and two height five feet ten inches minimum pounds one hundred and fifty average pounds one hundred and sixty maximum weight in pounds two hundred and ten height five feet eleven inches minimum pounds one hundred fifty five average pounds one hundred sixty five maximum weight in pounds two hundred and seventeen height six feet minimum pounds one hundred and sixty average pounds one hundred and seventy maximum weight in pounds two hundred and twenty five height six feet one inch minimum pounds one hundred sixty five average pounds one hundred seventy five maximum weight in pounds two hundred thirty three height six feet two inches minimum pounds one hundred and seventy average pounds one hundred and eighty maximum weight in pounds two hundred and forty height six feet three inches minimum pounds one hundred and seventy five average pounds one hundred and eighty five maximum weight in pounds two hundred and forty eight end of table three end of section forty eight recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 49 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Steam Engine. The principle of the steam engine is very simple. Stripped of all technicality, it may be described as follows. Take a can with a height somewhat longer than its width, and close up both ends. Make a hole in the center of one of the ends large enough for the insertion of a rod about the diameter of a small poker. Fasten one end of this rod to the center of a disc which will fit closely into the can. Insert this disc in the can with the poker passing through the hole. The whole apparatus will be similar to that of a churn. Bore two holes in the side of the can, at top and bottom. Allow steam to pass into the can through the first hole, which will force the disc to the other end of the can, and draw the poker with it. Then introduce steam through the other hole. This will drive the disc to the other end of the can, and at the same time the steam entering the first hole will pass out. This gives a motion to the poker rod, which continues so long as steam is forced in and out. 
the rod is of course connected with the crank which works on a shaft and from the shaft power is transmitted the steam is let into the cylinder automatically a flywheel is maintained where there is not more than one cylinder and even where there is more than one so as to create momentum which carries the crank beyond its dead center the modern steam engine makes from 100 to even 1000 revolutions a minute its power is measured by its capacity to equal that of one or several horses and is known as horsepower steam engines are made with a capacity of only a small fraction of horsepower and up to several thousand but usually where great power is required more than one cylinder is used all of them working upon the same shaft the so-called turbine steam engine is similar to the ordinary turbine water wheel except that steam instead of water is forced against it see turbines strikes the strike is an agreement upon the part of workmen to refuse to work until their demands are accepted the first strike in the united states took place in new york city in eighteen hundred and three and was confined to sailors in eighteen eighty eight there were six hundred and ninety seven strikes involving over two hundred and ten thousand employees in eighteen eighty six the number of strikes increased fifty two per cent and in 1888 the increase was 22 percent in the early days nearly half of the strikes were in pennsylvania the great coal strike of 1902 was probably the most disastrous and largest strike on record it involved about 150,000 men with a loss of wages of nearly 40 million dollars sub rosa the term under the rose implies secrecy it had its origin b c four hundred and seventy seven when pausanias commander of the fleet of spartans and athenians was intriguing with xerxes for the subjugation of greece to persia and for the hand of the king's daughter in marriage the business was transacted in the brazen house the roof of which was a garden making a bower of roses hence the term sub rosa sugar industry the united states consumes each year nearly three and a half million tons of sugar or about eighty pounds per capita end of section forty nine recording by phone section fifty of a thousand things worth knowing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Sunday Schools The Sunday schools of the United States have a membership of about 15,500,000, including teachers. The Sunday school membership of England and Wales is over 7 million. Connected with the Sunday schools of the world are about two million six hundred and fifty thousand teachers and twenty six million five hundred thousand scholars talking machines the talking machine known by several names including the phonograph was originally invented by edison unscientifically speaking it consists of a disc similar to that used in a telephone with a needle or point attached to the center of the underside of it this needle or point fits into circular or cylindrical grooves which are covered with tin foil or other malleable substance the vibrations of the point or of music which reach the disc cause this needle or point to rise or fall producing impressions upon the tin foil or other substance after the record has been made duplicates are produced in a substance largely made of rubber which is placed on a rotary disc or cylinder that is turned automatically the needle or point attached to the disc working into the grooves and rising with or following the impressions which cause the plate or disc to vibrate this process is wholly mechanical and electricity is not used tariff this word meaning a schedule of duties on merchandise imported or exported 
is said to come from tarifa a town in southern spain on the mediterranean sea where duties were once levied by the moors and on all ships passing in or out of the straits of gibraltar telegraph the conception of the telegraph came to professor morse in eighteen thirty two while he was making a voyage from europe to america and he at once began his experiments which resulted in what may be considered one of the two greatest inventions or discoveries after waiting about eight years congress reluctantly appropriated a sum sufficient to build a telegraph line between washington and baltimore the original conception of telegraphy belongs wholly to professor morse but since its invention other scientists have invented improvements including an apparatus which allows the sending of two messages each way or four messages in all over the same wire at the same time the telegraphic code or alphabet originally invented by morse remains practically intact it consists of dots and dashes and may be learned in a few hours although expertness requires a year or more of practice unscientifically speaking the telegraphic apparatus is extremely simple it consists primarily of a piece of soft iron around which is wound several strands of insulated wire during the time that electricity is passing through this wire the soft iron becomes a magnet but returns to its non-magnetic character when electricity is not passing around it a battery is used for the generating of electricity the operator turns electricity into the wire by pressing a key when the key is down the electricity passes around the piece of soft iron and makes of it a magnet which will draw iron or steel to it the same as does any ordinary permanent magnet just above the end of the soft iron is placed a piece of metal and as the key is pressed letting in the electricity the iron then a magnet draws this metal to it producing a slight sound or click this piece of iron is held by a spring and springs back into place when electricity is let out of the insulated wire surrounding the soft iron if a message is to be sent a long distance a relay is used so as to turn into the wire additional currents of electricity because electricity loses some of its strength if carried over a very long wire and the relay adds new or fresh currents from separate batteries in this way a message can be sent continuously for several thousand miles which would be impossible without the use of relays the process of sending several messages at the same time over the same wire is somewhat complicated the result is obtained by using currents of electricity of different intensity the currents not interfering with each other the ocean cables are described under another heading end of section 50 recording by phone Section 51 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Telephone. The telephone is supposed to have been invented by Professor A. G. Bell in 1875. The scientists recognized the probable invention of it largely in theory by the eminent scientists dolbeer gray edison and possibly others it is exceedingly difficult to describe other than scientifically the working of the telephone and it cannot be done perfectly until electricity is fully understood we know the result but are not able to locate all of the causes the original telephone consisted of a bar of magnetized steel of about the circumference of an ordinary poker a few inches in length around which was wound insulated wire at one end of the magnet and close to it was placed a metallic disc about twice the circumference of a silver dollar and of the thickness of thin tin originally the same instrument was used both for sending and for receiving any sound including the human voice brought in direct contact with the disc caused it to vibrate and for some unknown reason these vibrations were transmitted through the magnet and by the wires carried to another similar instrument the sounds and voice were carried a short distance without the use of a battery and the early telephones had ground circuits 
that is there was only one wire between the stations the other wire being grounded by being attached to gas or other pipes the electricity making half the circuit through the earth later on a battery was used which increased the sending distances but the ground wire remained for some time the present telephone consists of the original telephone as a receiver but with a transmitter into which the sender speaks his words the mechanism of the transmitter is complicated and cannot be described except scientifically its use allows one to talk long distances even to the extent of two thousand miles non-technically speaking then the telephone consists of a magnet insulated wire and a disc the vibration upon the disc being transmitted over the wire from the sending to the receiving station electricity being used for conveying the vibrations or sound eight billion four hundred thousand and twenty seven million conversations were held in this country last year over the wires of the american telephone and telegraph company according to its annual report the daily average was twenty six million three hundred ten thousand the company now has telephone stations in seventy thousand cities towns and hamlets which is five thousand more than the number of post offices in the country and ten thousand more than the number of railroad stations altogether there were seven million four hundred and sixty five thousand and seventy four telephone stations of the company at the end of nineteen hundred and twelve ten great religions james freeman clark in his book ten great religions gives the following as the ten most important faiths of ancient and modern times one confucianism two brahmanism three buddhism four zoroastrianism five religion of egypt six religion of greece and rome seven teutonic and scandinavian religion eight judaism nine christianity ten islam théâtre français the most famous theater in paris and perhaps in the world it is situated in the place du palais royal and is the home of the comédie française in 1900 it was destroyed by fire but immediately rebuilt the original building was erected in 1782 but was later much altered thunder the sound of thunder is produced by the sudden rush of air into the vacuum caused by the rapid passage of lightning through the air end of section 51 recording by phone Section 52 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Ticket of Leave. The English government in 1854 issued a permit which allowed a convict his liberty before the expiration of his term. It was necessary for him to report to the police at stated times, and, if he committed any crime, his ticket of leave was recalled. The ticket of leave is similar to probation granted in the United States. Time Difference when it is twelve o'clock noon in new york city it is five thirteen in antwerp about five forty nine in berlin about five thirteen in brussels about one o two in buenos aires about ten forty nine in calcutta about six fifty three in constantinople about four thirty in dublin about four thirty four in liverpool about four fifty six in london about five o five in paris about 546 in Rome, about 655 in St. Petersburg. When it is 12 o'clock noon in New York City, it is 33 and a half minutes earlier in Havana, 
about eleven hours and twenty eight minutes earlier in Hong Kong, about nine hours and twenty four minutes earlier in Melbourne, about nine hours and forty five and a half minutes earlier in Yokohama. Tobacco industry. The United States grows about 905 million pounds of tobacco a year, and over a million acres are used for growing tobacco. The value of the tobacco grown each year is about $85 million. To estimate the weight of hay, find the length, breadth, and depth of the hay in feet, and multiply these three dimensions together. If the hay is on the wagon, or newly stored, divide the product by 540. But if it is well settled in the mower stack, divide by 512. If the hay is baled, 270 cubic feet will weigh a ton. The number of cubic feet in a circular stack is found by multiplying the average circumference in yards by itself, and this product by four times the height of the stack in yards. Then point off the two right-hand figures and multiply the result by 27. To find length of day or night. At any time of the year, add 12 hours to the time of the sun setting, and from the sum, subtract the time of rising for the length of the day. Subtract the time of setting from 12 hours, and to the remainder, add the time of rising next morning for the length of the night. These rules are equally true for apparent time. To measure corn in the crib. Find the length, breadth, and depth of the corn in feet, and multiply these three dimensions together. This product multiplied by 0 0.63 will give the number of heaped bushels in the ear. Sometimes one and one half bushels of ears make a bushel of shelled corn and sometimes it requires two bushels, the amount required depending upon the size of the cob, shape of the ear, etc. Tom Thumb Tom Thumb was probably the most famous dwarf in the world, not because of the absence of others of the same height or less, but because he was exploited by the late P.T. Barnum. Tom Thumb, whose real name was Charles S. Stratton, was born in 1838 and died in 1883. In 1842 he was two feet in height and weighed 16 pounds. In 1863 his height increased to 31 inches and later to 40 inches. End of section 52. Recording by phone. Section 53 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. To produce different colors The color printed in italics may be made by mixing the two other colors purple red with light blue brown red with black rose lake with white drab umber with white chestnut white with brown chocolate yellow with brown flesh color carmine with straw pearl Blue with lead color. Pink. Carmine with white. Silver gray. Lamp black with indigo. Lead color. Lamp black with white. Bright green. Paris green with white. Buff. Yellow ochre with white. French white white tinted with purple dark green black with chrome green brilliant green emerald green with white pea green chrome green with white orange vermilion with chrome yellow straw color 
chrome yellow with white lead cream color white tinted with red and yellow ashes of roses white with tints of black and purple french gray white tinted with black and purple olive chrome yellow blue and black with red trade unions the trade union although supposed to be of modern origin was established as early as 1548 mythical history which of course cannot be authenticated indicates the possibility of an organization of working men at the time of the building of solomon's temple during the last several years trade unionism has grown to enormous proportions and practically every vocation has its union or organization the right to organize is self-evident so long as it does not restrain trade or interfere with personal rights the employee and employer certainly have legal and moral rights to do as they please provided they do not interfere with legal or moral law and do not use coercion moral influence however cannot be criticized the maintenance of a well-organized labor union is to the advantage of both capital and labor and should be encouraged naturally the binding together of laborers or workmen and that of capital causes some abuses for humanity as it runs is not always fair but one should not criticize either side without criticizing the other both have their advantages and disadvantages both are fair and unfair as civilization progresses the mistakes and abuses will be corrected and organized labor and capital will work in harmony trusts a trust is an association of capitalists organized for the purpose of controlling any one trade or trades it is illegal and may be punished by imprisonment or fine it is exceedingly difficult however to discover whether or not an organization is an actual restraint of trade and to prosecute the combination undoubtedly trusts exist in america and all over the world for that matter and are illegal great effort is being made to disband them but so far has very little real effect for most of the trusts which are disorganized by law continue in some other form turbines the turbine has largely taken the place of the water wheel because it is more compact produces greater energy and is more powerful it is untechnically speaking a box containing a series of fan-like blades set at an angle so that water or steam brought against them will make them turn. End of section 53. Recording by phone. Section 54 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Type Movable metallic type was invented by Gutenberg of Germany about 1450. Before this time, all books and papers were either handwritten or printed from engraved wooden blocks. Today there are over 50,000 faces and sizes of type. Type is divided into three great classes one roman or body type which is used for the reading matter in newspapers magazines and books two display type which appears in headings and is used for circulars and the like and three ornamental type which has a fancy face the different sizes of type formerly bore arbitrary names like nonpareil pica etc but now all type is under the point system Nonpareil being known as 6 point and pica as 12 point. The reading matter in all large daily newspapers is set in 6 point, but most books are printed from either 10, 11, or 12 point. 12 point type has twice the depth of 6 point type. Type to be set is placed in two cases, one known as uppercase and the other as lowercase. 
the former holding capitals and small capitals the latter small letters and figures both cases containing boxes for spaces and other characters the compositor holds in his left hand what is known as a composing stick or stick it is made of metal with a bottom and three sides the left side being movable and adjustable the compositor places one piece of type at a time in the stick setting the type from left to right and upside down he places metal spaces between each word when a line is completed he sets another with or without the piece of thin metal between the lines known as a lead when the stick is full he dumps his type into a galley which is a receptacle made of wood or metal from one to three feet long framed at the bottom and at the sides but open at the other end the type is then locked up in a steel frame or chase and is ready to be stereotyped electrotyped or to be printed from united states flag on june fourteenth seventeen seventy seven the united states congress declared that the flag of the thirteen united states be thirteen stripes alternate red and white that the union be thirteen stars white in a blue field representing the new constellation in 1794 congress decreed that after may 1st 1795 the flag of the united states be 15 stripes alternate red and white and that the union be 15 stars white in a blue field at that time the stars and stripes were of equal number and it was the intention to add both the star and stripe with the addition of each new state subsequently it was found that the addition of a stripe for each new state would produce a flag altogether too large accordingly congress on april fourth eighteen eighteen reduced the number of stripes to thirteen and made the number of stars twenty that being the number of states at the time it was further enacted that a new star should be added as each new state was admitted into the union by act of congress the flag has become a sacred emblem and cannot be used for other than decorative or patriotic purposes and cannot serve as a part of an advertisement or other announcement. End of section fifty four. Recording by phone. Section fifty five of One Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. One Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler United States History in Brief 1492, August 3rd, Columbus Sails from Palos, Spain 1492, October 12th, Columbus Discovered America 1607, May 13th, the English made first permanent settlement at Jamestown, Virginia 1609, September 11th, Henry Hudson commanding the half moon sailed into new york harbor sixteen twenty november eleventh the mayflower containing the pilgrims arrived at provincetown massachusetts sixteen twenty december twenty second the mayflower landed at plymouth rock plymouth massachusetts sixteen ninety september twenty fifth the first american newspaper was published at boston massachusetts seventeen thirty two february twenty second george washington first president of the republic was born seventeen forty three april thirteenth thomas jefferson was born seventeen sixty five march twenty second passage of the stamp act seventeen sixty seven march fifteenth andrew jackson born seventeen seventy march fifth massacre and riot in the streets of boston massachusetts seventeen seventy three december sixteenth the famous boston tea party was organized seventeen seventy five april eighteenth the ride of paul revere warning inhabitants of the coming battles of lexington and concord massachusetts seventeen seventy five april nineteenth the battle of lexington and concord massachusetts seventeen seventy five may twentieth the first declaration of independence was signed at mecklenburg north carolina seventeen seventy five june seventeenth battle of bunker hill at charlestown massachusetts seventeen seventy six march seventeenth the british evacuated boston 
seventeen seventy six june seventeenth george washington was appointed commander-in-chief of the american forces seventeen seventy six july fourth the declaration of independence was formally signed at philadelphia seventeen seventy six august twenty seventh battle of long island seventeen seventy six december twenty sixth battle of trenton seventeen eighty one october nineteenth cornwallis surrendered his army at yorktown virginia seventeen eighty three january twentieth the united states and great britain agreed upon secession of hostilities seventeen eighty three november twenty fifth new york was evacuated by the british seventeen eighty nine april thirtieth george washington was inaugurated first president of the united states seventeen ninety june twenty eighth washington district of columbia was made the capital of the united states seventeen ninety one august thirtieth issue of the first united states patent seventeen ninety two april second united states mint established at philadelphia pennsylvania seventeen ninety three september eighteenth laying of the cornerstone of the capital at washington district of columbia seventeen eighty four may eighth congress established the post office department seventeen ninety six september seventeenth president washington issued his farewell address seventeen ninety nine december fourteenth death of president washington eighteen o seven january nineteenth birth of general robert e lee eighteen o seven august eleventh first trial trip of a steamboat by robert fulton its inventor on the hudson river eighteen o nine february twelfth birth of abraham lincoln eighteen thirteen september tenth perry's victory on lake erie eighteen fifteen january eighth battle of new orleans eighteen sixteen december thirteenth establishment at boston massachusetts of the first savings bank in the united states eighteen nineteen may twenty second the first steam vessel to cross the atlantic ocean sailed from atlanta georgia eighteen forty four may twenty seventh first telegraph message sent by professor morse the inventor of telegraphy eighteen forty six april twenty third beginning of the mexican war eighteen forty seven february twenty second battle of buena vista eighteen forty seven september fourteenth capture of the city of mexico by the united states army eighteen fifty one august twenty seventh the yacht america won the international cup race at cowes england eighteen fifty eight august sixteenth the old world and the new world connected by telegraphic cable eighteen fifty nine october eighteenth capture of john brown at harper's ferry virginia eighteen sixty december twentieth south carolina seceded from the union eighteen sixty one april twelfth fort sumter south carolina bombarded eighteen sixty one april fifteenth president lincoln issued his first call for volunteers eighteen sixty one july twenty first battle of bull run eighteen sixty two march ninth fight in hampton roads virginia between the monitor and the merrimac eighteen sixty two april twenty eighth new orleans evacuated eighteen sixty two june sixth capture of memphis tennessee eighteen sixty two september fifteenth general stonewall jackson captured harper's ferry eighteen sixty two september seventeenth battle of antietam eighteen sixty three january first president lincoln issued the proclamation of emancipation eighteen sixty three february twenty fifth passage of the national bank act eighteen sixty three july first to third battle of gettysburg eighteen sixty three september nineteenth battle of chickamauga eighteen sixty four march sixth to eighth battle of the wilderness eighteen sixty four june nineteenth the warship kearsarge sank the alabama eighteen sixty four september second general sherman captured atlanta georgia eighteen sixty five april ninth general lee surrendered at appomattox eighteen sixty five april fourteenth john wilkes booth assassinated president lincoln eighteen sixty seven march thirtieth treaty for the purchase of alaska signed eighteen sixty nine may tenth completion of the union pacific railroad eighteen seventy one october eighth great fire at chicago eighteen eighty one july second president garfield shot by charles j guiteau eighteen eighty 
eighteen eighty six may fourth haymarket riot at chicago eighteen eighty nine may thirty first great flood at johnstown pennsylvania eighteen ninety three february fourteenth the hawaiian islands annexed to the united states eighteen ninety seven june fourteenth venezuela boundary line treaty ratified by congress eighteen ninety eight february fifteenth united states battleship maine blown up in havana harbor eighteen ninety eight april twenty first severance of diplomatic relations between spain and the united states eighteen ninety eight april twenty seventh matanzas cuba fired upon by american warships eighteen ninety eight may first admiral dewey destroyed the spanish fleet at manila eighteen ninety eight may sixth united states fleet bombarded santiago cuba eighteen ninety eight may twelfth admiral sampson fired upon san juan puerto rico eighteen ninety eight june third hobson sank the merrimac in the harbor of santiago that he might block the channel eighteen ninety eight june twenty second first landing of the united states troops in cuba eighteen ninety eight july third the spanish fleet destroyed at santiago eighteen ninety eight july sixteenth santiago surrendered eighteen ninety eight august thirteenth manila surrendered eighteen ninety eight november twenty eighth end of the spanish-american war nineteen o one september sixth president mckinley killed by leon zolgoltz nineteen o one september sixteenth hay pauncefote canal treaty ratified by congress nineteen o two july fourth declaration of peace with philippine islands and amnesty granted to all insurgents nineteen o four may fourth the united states took control of the panama canal end of section fifty five section fifty six of a thousand things worth knowing this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. University Extension A scheme for extending to people at large the advantages of a university education by means of courses of lectures and classes in various important cities. This scheme originated at the University of Cambridge, England, in 1872, and was introduced into the United States in 1890. University Settlements Homes established in the poorer parts of cities, where educated and cultured people may live and try to improve the lives of their neighbors. Lectures, studies, and various other devices are resorted to. The movement started in England in 1867 and appeared in New York in 1887 as a neighborhood guild. University settlements are now found in all the chief cities of the United States. Utopia An imaginary island, with an ideal commonwealth, the inhabitants of which enjoy perfect laws and institutions. It is described in Sir Thomas More's political romance, The Optimo Republicae Statu, de Guenova Insula Utopia, published in Latin in 1516 and translated into English in 1551. His purpose was to describe his idea of social arrangements by which the people's most absolute happiness and improvement might be secured. Vaccination Vaccination, a preventive of smallpox, was discovered by Dr. Edward Jenner of England. It consists of injecting into the blood a virus made from the sores or scabs of cows suffering from cowpox, or the virus may be taken from the sore coming from the vaccination itself. Comparatively few people, properly vaccinated, can have the smallpox and are largely exempt from any disease resembling it, except that which is known as viroloid, which is a mild form of smallpox. It is not known how long vaccination remains a preventive, but probably for seven years, when one should be vaccinated again. The prejudice against vaccination, which was very intense at its discovery, no longer exists except among a few. Practically every physician advocates it, and it is compulsory in some towns and cities. Deaths have occurred from it, but they are very infrequent. Vacuum The perfect vacuum, which is impossible to produce, is space without air or atmosphere. 
Vacuums are made by pumping all the air out of a receptacle or chamber. In a vacuum, everything falls at the same rapidity, as there is nothing to buoy it up, a feather descending as rapidly as a lead shot. Vedas Sacred writings of the Hindus, hymns, prayers and liturgies, said to have been compiled by Vyasa about 1200 BC. They are written in Sanskrit and divided into four parts. Voodooism a degraded form of religion prevalent among the Negroes of Haiti and the southern states of America, supposed to be a relic of the religion of equatorial Africa. Watered stock. It is said that the late Commodore Vanderbilt originated what is known as watered stock. Watered stock is capitalizing an industry at a figure in advance of its real value. For example, a railroad has tangible assets of $10 million and an earning capacity sufficient to pay a 6% dividend on its capitalization. Financial gains manipulate the stock and increase it to, say, $20 million, watering it to the extent of 100%. In other words, the real value of the stock then is one half of what it was in the first place. Stock watering has become epidemic and is the cause of hundreds of thousands of financial failures. The stock waterers, however, as a rule, win the public being the victims. End of section 56. Section 57 of 1000 Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. 1000 Things Worth Knowing by nathaniel c fowler jr wealth of the nations the estimated wealth of the principal nations of the earth is given in billions united states one hundred thirty great britain and ireland eighty france sixty five germany sixty and a half russia forty austria hungary twenty five italy twenty belgium nine spain five point four netherlands five portugal two point five switzerland two point four weather flags the weather bureau maintained by the united states department of agriculture displays at its stations flags which indicate probable changes in the weather a white flag indicates clear or fair weather a blue flag rain or snow a flag with the upper half white and the lower half blue local rain or snow a black triangular flag indicates temperature a white flag with black square in center a cold wave when the black triangular flag is placed above the white flag the black flag or the white and blue flag it indicates warmer weather when below colder when the black triangular flag is not displayed at all the temperature is likely to remain stationary flags are displayed by the weather bureau as storm warnings in the following manner small craft warning a red pennant indicates that moderately strong winds are expected. Storm warning. A red flag with a black center indicates that a storm of marked violence is expected. The pennants displayed with the flags indicate the direction of the wind. White, westerly, from southwest to north. Red, easterly, from northeast to south. The pennant above the flag indicates that the wind is expected to blow from the northerly quadrants below from the southerly quadrants by night a red light indicates easterly winds and a white light below a red light westerly winds hurricane warning two red flags with black centers displayed one above the other indicate the expected approach of a tropical hurricane or one of those extremely severe and dangerous storms which occasionally move across the lakes and northern atlantic coast no night small craft or hurricane warnings are displayed wedding anniversaries first cotton second paper third leather fourth fruit and flowers fifth wooden sixth sugar seventh woolen eighth india rubber ninth willow tenth tin eleventh steel twelfth silk and fine linen thirteenth lace fourteenth ivory fifteenth crystal twentieth china twenty-fifth silver thirtieth pearl fortieth ruby fiftieth golden seventy fifth diamond end of section fifty seven
Section 58 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Weights and Measures Long Measure Twelve Inches is one foot three feet is one yard two yards is one fathom sixteen and a half feet is one rod four rods is one chain ten chains is one furlong eight furlongs is one mile three miles is one league Square measure. Nine square feet is one square yard. Thirty and one quarter square yards is one square rod. Forty square rods is one rood. Four roods is one acre. Six hundred and forty acres is one square mile. An acre is 43,560 square feet. Dry measure. Two pints is one quart. Eight quarts is one peck. Four pecks is one bushel. Liquid measure. Four gills is one pint. Two pints is one quart. Four quarts is one gallon. Troy weight. Twenty-four grains is one penny weight. Twenty penny weights is one ounce. Twelve ounces is one pound. Avoir du poids weight. Sixteen drams is one ounce. Sixteen ounces is one pound. Twenty-five pounds is one quarter. Four quarters is one hundred. Twenty hundreds is one ton. Apothecary's weight. Twenty grains is one scruple. Three scruples is one dram. Eight drams is one ounce. Twelve ounces is one pound. Cubic measure. One thousand seven hundred and twenty-eight cubic inches is one cubic foot. Twenty-seven cubic feet is one cubic yard. Sixteen cubic feet is one cord foot. Eight cord feet is one cord. One hundred and twenty-eight cubic feet is one cord. Land measure. Seven point ninety-two inches is one link. Twenty-five links is one rod. Four rods is one chain. Eighty chains is one mile. Circular measure. Sixty seconds is one minute. Sixty minutes is one degree. Thirty degrees is one sign. Sixty degrees is one sextant. Ninety degrees is one quadrant. Three hundred and sixty degrees is one circle. Metric system. Measures of weight. One centigram is zero point one five four three two grains. One decigram is one point five four three two three grains, or zero point zero zero three ounce troy. One gram is fifteen point four three two three five grains 
or 0.032 ounce troy, or 0.002 pounds of war. One decagram is 154.32349 grains, or 0.321 ounce troy, or 0.022 pounds of war. One hectogram is 1,543.23488 grains, or 3.215 ounce troy, or 0 0.220 pounds of war, or 0 0.001 hundredweight. One kilogram is 15,432.34880 grains, or 32.150 ounce troy, or 2.204 pounds of war, or 0 0.019 hundredweight. Measures of length. One millimeter is 0 0.03937 inches, or 0 0.003 feet, or 0 0.001 yards. One centimeter is 0 0.39371 inches, or 0 0.032 feet, or 0 0.010 yards. One decameter is 393.70790 inches, or 32.808 feet, or 10.936 yards, or 0.006 miles. One meter is 39.37079 inches, or 3.280 feet, or 1.093 yards, one decimeter is 3.93708 inches, or 0 0.328 feet, or 0 0.109 yards. One hectometer is 3,937.07900 inches, or 328.089 feet or 109.363 yards, or 0 0.062 miles. One kilometer is 39,370.79000 inches, or 3,280.899 feet, or 1,093.633 yards, or 0 0.621 miles. Board and timber measure, board measure. In board measure, boards are assumed to be one inch in thickness. To compute the measure of surface in square feet. When all dimensions are in feet, multiply the lengths by the breadth and the product will give the surface required. When either of the dimensions are in inches, Multiply as above and divide by 12. When all dimensions are in inches, multiply as before and divide product by 144. Timber measure. To compute the volume of round timber, when all dimensions are in feet, multiply the length by the square of one quarter of the main girt, and the product will give the measurement in cubic feet. When length is given in feet and girt in inches, multiply as before and divide by 144. When all the dimensions are in inches, multiply as before and divide by 1728. Sod or hewed timber is measured by the cubic foot. To compute the volume of square timber, when all dimensions are in feet, Multiply the product of the breadth by the depth by the length, and the product will give the volume in cubic feet. When either of the dimensions are in inches, multiply as above, and divide the product by 12. When any two of the dimensions are in inches, 
Multiply as before and divide the product by 144. End of section 58. Recording by phone. Section 59 of 1000 Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. 1000 Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Chapter 59. What to Do in Emergencies. Many books and pamphlets have been written advising the layman what to do in case of emergency and in the absence of a physician or surgeon. Much of the information presented is altogether too technical and is not likely to be understood by the public at large. The author has attempted to cover, in a few pages, the fundamentals of first aid to the injured and has carefully avoided technical and medicinal terms. No amount of information, no matter how carefully or plainly written, can take the place of the physician or surgeon. Self-doctoring and dosing is or should be considered a crime, and no one is justified in attempting to relieve any one suffering from accident or any other ailment if it is of possible seriousness unless a good physician or surgeon cannot be procured. First and always keep your head, and keep cool. Don't get excited. Work rapidly but deliberately. If the injury or trouble is at all serious, summon a surgeon or physician immediately. If you are alone with the sufferer, it may not be safe for you to leave him, but unless he is in immediate danger, it is better to call a competent physician, even though you have to be absent yourself from him for a few moments. If the accident occurs in a crowd, solicit someone who looks trustworthy and request him to telephone or otherwise communicate with the doctor. If you know the cause of the accident or trouble, inform the physician in advance so he may be better prepared to meet it and bring with him instruments and remedies. The patient or sufferer should be placed in a comfortable position, a doctor or surgeon summoned, and in the interval the layman may follow the instructions presented here. If he does so, no harm will be done, and in many cases suffering will be relieved and death or serious illness prevented. But the author again, and most emphatically, urges the layman to send for a physician or surgeon, and to follow the instructions or information given in this chapter only as preliminary to the arrival of the doctor or surgeon, unless the injury be of slight consequence. If possible, remove the patient to a quiet place where there is plenty of air and where the temperature is normal. If there are many people about, request them to keep away. Place the injured person in a comfortable position, usually upon his back, and straighten out his legs and arms. If the head is injured, better lift it above the level of the body, but if it is not, allow the body to lie on a level. If the patient is breathing hard, it may be well to lift him into sitting position. Loosen his collar, waistband, and clothing. If he faints, his head should be slightly lower than his feet. If an arm or leg is injured, lift it slightly and place it upon a cushion, pillow, or other support. If the one injured is unconscious, watch him very carefully. If he is vomiting or that tendency is apparent, turn him over on one side so that the discharge will run out easily and not go into the lungs. If he is wounded, cut away the clothing covering the wound, but don't remove any more than is necessary. If he has been burned, pour a lukewarm water containing a little saleratus or bicarbonate of soda over the clothing before you remove it. If he is bleeding severely, stop the bleeding before dressing the wound. After the wound is dressed, there is nothing for the novice to do except bring the patient to consciousness, if unconscious, and remove him to a place of safety and comfort. If the accident or injury be serious or the patient is unconscious, it is well to request more than one bystander to summon a physician, because the first one sent may fail, or the physician he telephones to or calls upon may be unavailable. Use the telephone if there is one at hand or nearby, and tell the physician what you think is the matter with the sufferer, or what caused the accident that he may be better prepared to bring with him the instruments necessary. If you are alone with the patient and cannot notify a physician or a surgeon without leaving the patient, you must use your best judgment, but you should make every possible effort to reach a physician at the earliest possible moment. Remain with the patient long enough to place him in a comfortable position and to stop the flow of blood if bleeding, then make all haste to notify a physician or surgeon. The author acknowledged his indebtedness to Johnson's first aid manual, published by Johnson & Johnson of New Brunswick, New Jersey, and to J.W. Seaver, M.D. of New Haven, Connecticut, and recently of Yale University. End of section 59. Section 60 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Accidents Convey the sufferer to a place of safety, and give him plenty of air. If a shock follows, follow instructions given for shock. Do not touch the wound with the bare hand. Wear absolutely clean gloves, or wrap the fingers in clean cloth or gauze. Do not attempt to cleanse the wound. Summon the surgeon immediately. Apparent Death Never assume that a person is dead because he appears to be. Summon a physician. A fairly good test of death is to hold the hand of the person apparently dead before a candle or other light, with the finger stretched out, each touching the other. Gaze intently between the fingers, and if the person is alive, a red or pink colour will undoubtedly be seen where the fingers touch each other. Another method is to take a cold piece of polished steel, like a razor blade or table knife, and hold before the mouth or nose of the person apparently dead. If moisture does not gather on it, it may be safe to assume that breathing has stopped, but these tests are not infallible. Bandaging There are two kinds of bandages, the roller bandage or the triangular or handkerchief bandage. They may be purchased at any drugstore or be made on the spot in an emergency. The purchased bandages are made of gauze or muslin, crinoline, elastic webbing, rubber or other material. The roller bandages are absorbent and are very thin and pliable. They should be placed next to the wound and hold the fluids. Muslin bandages are stronger than those made of gauze and should be used for pressure and outside bandages. Bandages should be kept in a perfectly clean place and always covered, either by being enclosed in a box or wrapped in paper. If an improvised bandage is used, care should be taken to use a clean cloth. The triangular bandage is made by cutting a piece of cloth about 36 inches square into two pieces diagonally. It can be purchased at a drugstore, or any clean cloth can be used if it is of firm texture. Baths. Cold baths may be taken to reduce fever and in sunstroke or other cases when the temperature is high. It is well to have the temperature in the bath at 70 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and to reduce the water until it reaches 60 or 65. Tepid baths have a temperature of 80 or 90 degrees, and warm baths are of a temperature from 90 degrees to a little less than 100 degrees. Hot baths may be used in case of shock, apparent drowning, depression, and similar troubles. The temperature of the water should vary from 98 degrees to 110 degrees. When the patient leaves the bath, he should be dried quickly and put to bed. Hot baths may produce fainting and should be taken in the presence of an attendant. Do not guess at the temperature of the water. Use a thermometer. End of section 60. Recording by phone. Section 61 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Bleeding Arterial blood, or blood coming from the arteries, is bright red and is discharged in spurts or jets. Such bleeding is very dangerous, and unless the physician arrives almost immediately, the patient is not likely to survive. Venous blood, which comes from the veins, is of dark purple colour, and flows freely and steadily. Capillary bleeding comes from injured small veins. It flows slowly, and such bleeding is dangerous only if it continues. Always summon a surgeon or physician, and put in a hurry call for him. Force the patient to lie down in a level position, preferably upon his back. 
if the leg or arm is wounded elevated cut away the clothing quickly so that it may be exposed press the bleeding places but cover your finger with gauze or a clean handkerchief to, or compress the part by using a strong cloth bandage if the bleeding comes from an artery cover your finger with a few thicknesses of gauze or clean cloth and press hard upon the wound and maintain the pressure which may stop the bleeding if the wound is large crowd a lot of gauze into it and push it in then press on the flesh a little distance above the wound that is between the wound and the heart this can be done by winding a bandage a piece of rubber tubing string or rope or a pair of suspenders may be used above the wound if the arm or leg is crushed do not press on the wound but bring pressure to bear above it bleeding from the veins lay a piece of gauze over the wound and bind it on with a firm bandage be very careful not to apply your naked fingers or hand to the wound unless you have washed them in some antiseptic but even then it is better to cover your fingers with clean gauze or cloth if the bleeding is very severe apply cracked ice wrapped in gauze and hard pressure below the wound varicose veins occasionally bleed elevate the arm or leg and bandage it very tightly the bandage to be placed directly over the bleeding spot bleeding from capillary veins as the blood oozes and does not flow rapidly expose the wound to the air for a short time which will usually check it the application of hot water is advisable but warm water should not be used extremely cold water or cracked ice will stop some bleeding if copious bleeding occurs around the tooth it may be stopped by packing the place with plaster of paris or absorbent cotton may be used in every case keep the places warm after the bleeding is stopped give hot drinks like hot tea coffee or milk if much blood has been lost broken bones do not attempt it set to break handle the patient carefully place him in a comfortable position and undress him removing the clothing by cutting it to save time if it is necessary to carry him a distance improvise a splint made of wood or heavy pasteboard and fasten it around the broken part with bandages carry him to a physician or summon one at once but let him lie quietly if a physician can reach him it is well to have two splints one on each side to be held in place by the same bandages if the arm is broken bandage it and place it in a sling in every case summon a physician or carry the patient to one chilblains keep the feet warm and dry don't warm them at the fire or place them in hot water but bathe them in cold water and rub with a dry towel apply turpentine camphorated spirits or oil of wintergreen end of section 61 recording by phone Section 62 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Cleanliness. It is said that cleanliness is next to godliness. Good health is dependent upon the care of the body, and the body will not remain in a healthful state unless frequently bathed. The fact that thousands of people enjoy good health without even taking an infrequent bath must not be used as an argument against regular bathing. These persons, if in health, live out of doors, and nature seems to take care of them but it is obvious that they would be healthier and stronger if they gave proper attention to bodily cleanliness the majority of city dwellers and a large proportion of those living in the country work indoors and their health is dependent upon their personal cleanliness opinions differ 
and some hygienists do not consider the daily baths essential but the majority of those who have studied the subject maintain that perfect health requires the daily bathing of the entire body without the daily bath one does not begin his work refreshed or with exhilaration a scrub is not to be recommended more than once a week but a bath should be taken daily and the entire body rubbed with a dry towel a bath towel to be preferred immersion in a tub of water is not necessary although it is the best and easiest way of taking a bath next to a shower bath a sponge bath answers all purposes a cold plunge should not be taken without the advice of a physician the shower bath is very refreshing a hot bath is seldom advisable it is better to have the water of a temperature not much higher than that of summer heat a pure soap should be used and care should be taken to rinse it from the body the daily bath is the best preventive of colds comparatively few people who bathe daily suffer from more than transient colds the bath should not be taken in a draught if the room is cold work rapidly and use additional time for rubbing continuing it until the skin glows the practice of partial bathing is not to be recommended when you take a bath take it all over if away from home and sleeping in a hotel bed which may have been occupied by a diseased person it is well to go over the body carefully in the morning with an antiseptic soap every hotel and all public conveyances are laden with germs and a bath will prevent many diseases a few drops of ammonia or a teaspoonful of borax placed in the water in which you bathe will remove the odor of perspiration but ammonia should not take the place of good soap clothing a fire force the person a fire to lie down and roll him over and over wrap him in a rug or blanket or anything else at hand throw water upon him but do not wait for water wrapping him in a blanket is sure to extinguish the flames under no circumstances allow the person a fire to run about or out of doors colds use simple remedies such as hot lemonade but if the cold does not soon abate consult a physician diphtheria consult your physician never go near a case of diphtheria or allow a dog cat or other animal to enter the sick room be careful of every utensil and do not allow anyone else to use them until they have been washed in antiseptics never handle any clothing or other articles in a sick room end of section 62 recording by phone section 63 of a thousand things worth knowing this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Disinfectants The reader is warned against placing reliance upon any disinfectant because it smells of carbolic acid or has any other strong odor. Many of the advertised disinfectants are worthless, and some of them are merely deodorizers which destroy smell and don't disinfect. Sulfur or brimstone is probably the best fumigator. Sulfite of iron, copperas, is cheap and should be used for sewers and drains. Dissolve a pound and a half in a gallon of water. Two parts of sulfate of zinc to one part of common salt, dissolved in a gallon of water, is a good disinfectant for clothing, bed linen, etc. Carbolic acid is an excellent disinfectant but is efficacious only when used at considerable strength, 3 to 5 percent. Its strong odor suggests qualities which do not exist if it is much diluted. There are many disinfectants upon the market, many of them being advertised to be efficacious. Some of them are thoroughly reliable, but others are almost worthless. 
I would advise the reader not to purchase or use a disinfectant which is not recommended by a reliable physician. Disinfecting cellars, yards, cesspools, etc. Use a solution made of 60 pounds of copperas dissolved in a barrel of water. Sprinkle fleetly over cellar and put a pailful in a cesspool. Disinfect in the sick room. Plenty of fresh air and cleanliness are to be first considered. The clothing, bed linen and towels should be washed in a tub containing a zinc chloride solution, and the water should be boiling hot. A solution of copperas and water should be immediately placed in all vessels containing discharges. Dislocations. The novice should never attempt to treat a dislocation. All he can do is to place the patient in a comfortable position, using a sling or cushion to support the part injured. A physician should be summoned. Dog bites. Wash the wound with antiseptic soap or pure soap and water, with borax dissolved in it to the strength of a teaspoonful to a pint. Hydrophobia occurs very infrequently, and many dogs, supposed to be mad, are suffering from some other ailment, but a surgeon should be summoned in all cases whenever it is possible to do so. The bite of a rat, cat, or other animal is not generally dangerous, but the wound should be washed with borax and water as above. Better summon a surgeon. Suck the wound vigorously before applying washes. There is no danger to the person sucking a wound of this nature, unless the skin on his lips or in his mouth is cracked or bleeding but he may wash his mouth with borax water if he feels uneasy about it. End of section 63 Section number 64 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Drowning If the person is conscious, tell him that you will save him, which will prevent him from losing his nerve. If you swim out for him and he is struggling, seize him by the hair and turn him over on his back. Swim on your side, towing him along as you would a log of wood. You may hold his head with one arm, but do not attempt to support his entire body. If he struggles violently, hold his head under water until he is unconscious, so that you can better handle him. Loosen his clothing, drain water out of lungs by inverting the body, clean out his mouth, and pull his tongue forward. Immediately begin artificial respiration. Each movement to last from four to five seconds. Apply warmth and rubbing, and when he is conscious, give him hot water, coffee or lemonade. Artificial breathing is of greatest consequence. Do not give up. Many persons have been resuscitated after many hours of incessant labor. Artificial respiration may be performed in the following way. First, immediately loosen the clothing about the neck and chest, exposing them to the wind, except in very severe weather. Get the water out of the body. First by tickling throat with a feather, or applying ammonia to the nose. Give a severe slap with the open hand upon the chest and soles of feet. If no immediate result, proceed as follows. Second, lay the body down in the open air with the head hanging down and with its weight on the stomach across any convenient object, such as a keg, box, boat timber, or your knees. Open the mouth quickly, drawing the tongue forward with a handkerchief or cloth to let the water escape. Keep the mouth clear of liquid. To relieve the pressure on the stomach, roll the body gently from side to side and then back on the stomach. Do this several times to force the water from the stomach and throat. Third, lay the body on the back. Make a roll of a coat or any garment. Place it under the shoulders of the patient, allowing the head to fall back. Then kneel at the head of the patient. Open patient's mouth and place some small object between teeth. With tongue pliers or fingers covered with gauze or cloth, grasp his tongue and draw it out. Tie it down to his chin with cloth or rubber band. Grasp the patient's arms at the middle of the forearms, 
fold them across his stomach, and raise them over his head to a perpendicular position, drawing them backward, straight, then forward overhead to the sides again, pressing the arms on the lower part of the ribs and side, so as to produce a bellows movement upon the lungs. Do this about 15 times a minute. Apply smelling salts, camphor, or ammonia to the nostrils to excite breathing. Fourth, on signs of life, or when breathing is restored, remove the clothing, dry the body, wrap the patient in warm blankets or hot cloths. To encourage circulation, briskly rub his limbs under the blankets toward the heart. Brandy or aromatic spirits of ammonia may be given in small doses with care to avoid strangulation. End of section 64 Section 65 of A Thousand Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Drowning Another Method Another simple method of restoring breathing, one that is being rapidly adopted, is that known as the Schaffer, or prone method. It has the great advantage that it can be performed by one man alone. This method has just been endorsed as a preferable one by a commission representing the American Medical Association, the National Electric Light Association, and the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. First, lay patient on stomach with his head to side and with all his tongue, which itself then will hang out if teeth are held apart with a small object. The operator then kneels astride the patient's thighs and with his hands across the lower ribs swings his body back and forth rhythmically, pausing about two seconds as his weight falls upon and is removed from patient. This movement is to be continued at the rate of about 15 times a minute. To prevent drowning, the human body weighs in the water about one pound. That is, it is approximately one pound heavier than the water which it displaces. A stool, chair, or small box or board will overcome the tendency to sink and will keep the head above water. The feet and the hand which is not clinging to an object should be used as paddles. Everyone should learn to swim. If he can take only a few strokes, the chances of death by drowning are small, for he is likely to be able to reach something which will support him. So much do I believe in the necessity of knowing how to swim that I consider it a crime not to understand this art. Electrical accidents. Immediately shut off the current, but do not handle the wire with your naked hands. If rubber gloves are not handy, cut the wire with an axe or knife, with a piece of woolen cloth wrapped around the handle. If you pull the sufferer away from the wire, do not touch him with your bare hands, but cover them with woolen cloth, or wear rubber or woolen gloves or remove him by the use of a rope. The ordinary electric shock will not cause death unless the patient continues to receive it. Summon a doctor at once. Place the patient in the open air with something under his shoulders. Loosen his clothing, open his mouth, and pull out the tongue. Clear the mouth from saliva. Force air into his lungs by pressing the base of the ribs about once in four seconds. Then attempt to resuscitate him as you would a drowning person. Emergencies with children If the child suddenly suffers from vomiting, purging or prostration, send for a doctor at once. In the meantime, place him in a hot bath and then carefully dry him with a warm towel and wrap in warm blankets. If the hands and feet are cold, apply hot water bottles to the feet and hands. A poultice made of flaxseed meal, three-fourths, and mustard, one-fourth, should be placed over the body. Five drops of brandy in a teaspoonful of water may be given every 15 minutes. For sudden diarrhea, administer one teaspoonful of castor oil or of spiced syrup of rhubarb. Allow the child to drink freely of cold water that has been boiled. Always summon a physician. End of section 65 Section 66 of 1,000 Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. One Thousand Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Chapter 66 Emergency Medicines. The writer would emphatically discourage self medication and dosing, and would oppose the taking of medicines of any kind except the simplest remedies without the advice of a physician. Hundreds of thousands of people have been made sick because the wrong medicine was administered to them, and many more have taken medicine when they didn't need it. The following emergency medicines are presented with a distinct understanding that they should not be used except in simple cases. Ammonia. What is known as ammonia water, or a liquor of ammonia, or as spirits of hartshorn, or hartshorn, is of several strengths and is highly irritating and poisonous if taken internally. Applied externally, if of considerable strength, it will cause blisters and pain. Ammonia should not be applied to an open wound or irritated surface except in case of snake bites or stings of insects, where it is intended to neutralize the poisons. The vapor of ammonia water, inhaled through the nostrils, affects the nervous system and may be used in fainting or epilepsy, but always with caution. For a strong preparation of ammonia applied to the nose may produce a violent shock. It is better to saturate a handkerchief or a wad of cotton and hold it a short distance from the nostrils. The buyer is cautioned against the use of the strongest ammonia water. Aromatic spirits of ammonia. This is a stimulant and may be used in cases of sick headache, hysteria, colic, or fainting, in doses from 10 to 30 drops in sweetened water. Arnica. Tincture of arnica is supposed to be of value in accidents and especially efficacious for sprains and bruises. It has some value, mainly from the alcohol it contains, and partly because it is applied with friction. It is a poison and should never be taken internally. For external use, it should not be applied at its full strength, as it is apt to cause inflammation if the skin is tender. Bicarbonate of soda. Bicarbonate of soda, commonly known as baking soda or saleratus, is distinct from sal soda or washing soda. It is of great value in the treatment of burns and may be used as an antidote in poisonings by acid. Camphor. Camphor is purchased in gum or in liquid form. It should never be taken internally except by advice of a physician, nor should it be applied in its full strength directly to the wounds or to irritated or inflamed surfaces. Ginger. The essence or extract of ginger is a very popular remedy for troubles with the digestive organs, bowel complaints, etc., and should be taken in doses from 10 to 40 drops in sweetened water, milk, or other liquid. It should never be used habitually, because it may establish a drug habit nor should large doses be taken to check diarrhea, as it is often inadvisable to too rapidly check the discharges. Glycerin. Glycerin may be used for burns, and, mixed with equal parts of rose water, it is a good lotion for chapped hands or lips, but it is irritating to the skin of some people. End of section 66. Section 67 of 1,000 Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. 1,000 Things Worth Knowing by Nathaniel C. Fowler, Jr. Chapter 67. Emergency Medicines. Peppermint. The essence of peppermint may be used for stomach ache and bowel complaints the usual dose being from 10 to 20 drops on sugar or in sweetened water. Oil of peppermint should not be taken except when prescribed by a physician. Turpentine. Turpentine is the base of most liniments and has some value, but mustard plasters are safer. Turpentine is inflammable and never should be applied near an open fire. Turpentine should not be given internally unless prescribed by a physician. Whiskey. Whiskey, brandy, wine, and all other spirits should be used sparingly. They are likely to do more harm than good. Hot water, hot coffee, hot tea, or aromatic spirits of ammonia are to be preferred. Children should never be given spirituous liquids, except in extreme cases, and then only 10 to 20 drops in water. Witch hazel or hamamelis, used as a remedy for sprains, wounds, and swelling, it is a mild application for chapped hands, and used by the laity for burns, scalds, cuts, etc. It is not irritating and is a good substitute for arnica. 
its use externally is absolutely safe. Vaseline. It is to be recommended for burns, scalds, etc. It is non-irritating and not poisonous. It can be used frequently. Cold cream, a perfectly safe article to be used for chapped hands and lips and skin roughness. Emetics and stimulants. In practically all cases and where poison has entered the stomach, it is well to empty the stomach immediately. If a stomach pump cannot be procured, an emetic should be administered. Doctors would administer Ipecac, apomorphine, sulfate of zinc, tartar emetic, and other drugs, but none of them are likely to be available before the physician arrives. When notifying the physician, tell him, if possible, the kind of poison taken, so he may be prepared. A dessert spoonful of ground dry mustard and a glass of warm water is likely to produce vomiting. Follow the first dose with the second one, then push the forefinger down the throat as far as possible, that the patient may vomit. Dissolve a teaspoonful of salt in water and give to the patient, or administer a teaspoonful of Ipecac every few minutes to a child, and a tablespoonful to an adult. Follow the dose with a glass of water, and then insert the forefinger in the throat. One who has taken opium does not vomit easily, and strenuous effort should be made to produce vomiting. If one emetic does not work, give another, and keep on repeating it. End of section 67